Just go for it. All right. Hey, everybody. So we're going to get started. All right. So to get started, I actually have a question for you, and it's not my usual question. Has anybody here like ever spilled water near their laptop before? Anybody? Make me feel a little bit better? OK, so less than 12 hours before I got on the plane to come out here, that's exactly what I did. And so now my laptop is in a bag of rice, so we'll see. Cross your fingers. Luckily, my mom had given me this computer because it had Windows 8 on it, and she couldn't stand Windows 8, so she just gave it to me, and it's been sitting on my desk. So, you know, it's old and out of date, and it wouldn't update anything. It wouldn't let me download anything. PowerPoint worked, even though it said, like, expired on it. It still would work. And... Uh, but it would crash a lot, so I realized if I was going to do this presentation, I needed to make PowerPoint not crash. So I needed to get rid of whatever malware was on it. So that's what I did last night, get rid of all the malware that my mother had downloaded along with those free games that she likes. But once I got the malware off, right, I got the malware, the next thing that happened, you know, I open up PowerPoint to make sure that it's working, says, oh, PowerPoint is expired, you can no longer use it. So on top of stopping me from getting updates, it was actually stopping Microsoft Office from telling that I hadn't activated. So that virus was actually useful. Thank you, malware writers. All right, so let's actually talk about mobile things now that I've shown you how silly I am. All right, obviously this has to go with me because if I turn my head, you can't hear me anymore. All right, so we want to close this slideshow and use the other slideshow. And so down with this slideshow and up with this one. Slideshow play from beginning. There we go. Just checking. Again, I haven't used Windows in a long time. All right, so I'm Georgia and really happy to be here. I hadn't been to Kentucky in a while, um, but I actually came out for this and made a re-association with DerbyCon, so thanks. All right, so we're going to talk about mobile. We all have one of these, right? A mobile device. Maybe a few Android people represent. iOS people. I have one of those as well. The great thing about being a phone person is that you can buy lots of phones, and it's a business expense. So I actually have seven. So we're going to talk about risk around mobile devices. I see a lot of people doing application security work around mobile, and that's awesome. We all probably know that applications have a lot of vulnerabilities. Also see people on the forensic side working with mobile. But when it comes to you know, our everyday run of the mill, we're the security team and we are in charge of securing all the assets, or we're the consultants, the penetration testers, or vulnerability assessors, we kind of leave those mobile devices alone. You know, We might get a good or a mobile iron or something like that, but we don't really do anything more than that. We don't really test to see what the state of security, what the risk around those guys is. And now that I'm selling products, it's really depressing to go into like a consulting firm and say, I have this really cool product for mobile. And they're like, yeah, that's really cool, but there's no way our clients are ever going to buy that. Sorry. I don't feel like China feels the same way for some reason. All right, so let's talk a little bit about mobile devices. Yeah, we all have phones, iPads, smart watches. They have watches with SIM cards now. Awesome. Eyeglasses, all sorts of things. But there are some things that are mobile devices that you might not consider. For instance, is this a mobile device? It is a toilet. Naturally, the toilet was not really blue. Again, it was cross-communication with my mother. I said, make all the figures blue. And this is what I got back. But I liked it. It was cute. So is this a mobile device? Anybody think yes? What? All right. I guess you all think no, then. Well, as it turns out, toilet to mobile vulnerability. So this is from Trustwave. This is a Trustwave advisory. So it's a hard-coded Bluetooth pin vulnerability in a particular kind of smart toilet. Some of your rich friends may have these sorts of things in their guest bathrooms. They have little walkie-talkie things that they can talk to and push the buttons. They talk over Bluetooth. This one in particular will let you control it through an Android app. So while it's not, I guess, technically Internet of Things, because it's not Internet facing, at least on the local network or if you are close enough to it, you can actually hack this toilet from a proximity. 
because it has a hard-coded pin in it. Those people who do embedded development, they want us to understand how hard it is to enter a password that is random inside of their firmware. It's much, much easier to just set the code to 0000, zero, zero, zero and let it automatically enter itself each time. And that's exactly what this toilet did. So according to Trustwave, their report for the risk is attackers could cause the unit to unexpectedly open slash close the lid, activate bidet or air dry functions, causing discomfort or distress to user. That sounds like a mobile device to me. All you need to do is talk to it via Bluetooth. There's an Android app you can get from the store. That sounds like fun to me. Other things that we might not consider as mobile devices. What about this guy, a blue car? Well, we all know that. Charlie Miller took care of that with his brake slamming. Well, that particular vulnerability was not in the car at all. It was in the entertainment system, which basically had a dumbed down Android phone in it. It was a, a mobile modem in the entertainment system. That is how they got into the, the car, was basically through the cellular network. It's much like our applications can call down to us and say, you have a new tweet. They can do the same thing through the entertainment system. It can push things to it as though it's internet facing. In a way, it kind of is. So we have all these mobile devices, be they a toilet, a car, or just a mobile phone of sorts. And we can, in a lot of cases, talk to them as if they're internet facing, as if they're your web server. Well, what do we do about securing our web servers, right? That's where we put a lot of our security practice. Our first place to spend our money is securing those internet facing assets so that hackers don't get them. So why are we ignoring all these internet facing mobile devices? Who knows? But the better question is, really, if you want to get philosophical about it, if the car and the toilet are mobile devices, is this a mobile device? The phone. This is like one of the original phones, if you will. It only called from the guest house to the main house, if you will. I found it in Columbia at Security Zone one year. Technically, I would say this is actually not a mobile device, even though we think mobile devices are phones. So it's one of those SAT problems, I guess. Not all bobs are bins and bins are Bob's, I don't know. I, there's a reason I didn't go to high school. All right, so mobile. We kind of touched on this. Mobile, you can basically think of pretty much any mobile device as basically an internet-facing device. What's worse than that is there those internet-facing devices that are dual-homed often into your network. You know, we as consultants and security teams, we love to see web servers with vulnerabilities, and we get onto them, and we say, oh, it's also a member of the internal domain. Awesome. Domain admin from outside. Yay. Security problem needs to be fixed. Our mobile devices can really be seen the same way. They talk via the mobile modem to the world. You can talk to it via its phone number or even push to it via an app all over the mobile network. But then when we go to work or we get home or we go to the coffee shop, we hook it up to the Wi-Fi network and it can see everything that's around it. Think about your workplace. What do you have to do to put your mobile device on the network? The best answer would be, we don't. The second best answer would be, you know, we're in our own VLAN, we're in a, basically a guest network. But unfortunately, particularly with small companies, you know, they don't have a big budget for those $5 a seat for mobile iron or whatever. I mean, that adds up. Let's face it, you've got, you know, a couple hundred users. That starts to get pretty expensive. Well, they just give out the Wi-Fi password to everybody, and they put on whatever they want. Even at security shops, unfortunately, this is all too frequent. So in that case, that's really what you're looking at. You now have a web server that is also a member of your domain, and it's in every one of your employees' pockets. And we're just ignoring this issue completely. So what do we do when we exploit a web server that's internet-facing? Well, we don't just go home and say, yay, the pen test is done. We pivot now that we have exploited the web server and now we're on the internal network. We see what else we can see. Workstations, domain controllers, development boxes, databases that are only available inside because they're super secret and secure. Well, we can do the same thing for the phone. If we exploit a phone, 
from its internet-facing side, we can now attack other devices on the network, be it at your home, think about all the things you have on your home network, maybe things you might not want the world to see. You know, we see this in every breach, you know, the hacking team, for instance, probably didn't want us to know all that stuff. Target certainly didn't want us to. And Sony, well, those emails about how much divas those rock stars were, oh, that was awesome. But let's just face it, there's things that we do on our home networks, there's things that we do at the coffee shop, and there's things that we do at the work network that we'd rather not have people know about. Our phone opens up not just us, our family members, other people in our community, and certainly our workplaces to these kinds of attacks. We secure our perimeter and then just let the phones walk in. But everybody says, well, there's no mobile vulnerability. If there was mobile vulnerability, then it would be splashed all over the front of the New York Times. Mobile attack brings down big company. Anybody seen the attribution dice? I mean, attribution is hard. Just because it's not on the front page of the New York Times doesn't mean it's not happening. But if it ever does show up on the front page of the New York Times, I, for one, will be very rich the next day. Maybe you would like to be too, who knows? Well, thanks to Charlie Miller, we saw how remote attacks can happen to mobile devices. Unfortunately, you know, people don't think, oh, car, mobile phone, but it's absolutely the exact same sort of thing. We saw also at Black Hat this year, the stage fright vulnerability, which frightened everyone about Android. Everybody was like, that's a silly name. What they didn't realize is that's actually the name of the library in the Android, not even the name of the vulnerability. So it's not even up there with Poodle and Sandworm. You're going to have to go to Android for that one. So stage fright, for those who are iPhone users and thus not familiar, all you had to do was send somebody an MMS, so a text message with picture or video. They didn't have to click on anything. There was no phishing aspect, it just had to appear on their phone and it could give you remote access to the phone. This on practically the latest versions of Android. These are some people who are at least trying to take security pretty seriously. They've got a security team who spends their, all of their time trying to secure their platform and they've got remote vulnerabilities in their code. What hope is there for the rest of us? So it is possible that just remotely we can attack phones. If you ever go, anybody here ever going to like China or something like that? Anybody planning to go to China? Because I'd like to send you with a phone and maybe a tablet so I can see what comes back with you. Because your phone pretty much, as gospel, takes what the carrier says to it and says, okay, I'm going to do that. There's not really much you as a user see around that. It just magically happens. Your phone hops from tower to tower. It roams when it doesn't see its proper cell service, etc. So we've certainly seen attacks in the past. We see them in the wild, like China basically updates all your apps the moment you get off the plane. So if you put up a malicious cell tower, your phone will do what it says, including install nasty grams for you. So you can come home with malware without doing anything just because the cell tower told you to. So, I mean, in the case of the NSA, we saw that they don't really need exploits. They just sit on the towers and listen. But for those who, you know, aren't that cool, you can just set up a cell tower of your own, overpower all the cell towers around you, and all the phones will listen. You could do this in your house right now as a hobbyist. The bigger antennas are going to cost you more money, but a short range antenna just to play, you could do this with a couple thousand dollars. Exactly how nation states do it on a wide scale. So. That's way too easy, right? That's MSO8067 territory, stuff where you just hit the button on Metasploit and the magic happens. We are in 2015. Things should be harder than that. So let's pretend that doesn't happen. Mobile client size. We all know about client size, right? We update everything. We run our vulnerability scanner. Our vulnerability scanner looks on the network and it says there are no vulnerabilities here. And we get a gold star and we pass our PCI. Yay for us. But then we find that we're still getting compromised because things like our Internet Explorer or our iTunes or our Adobe Reader or our Flash, all those things, those aren't being checked by that vulnerability scanner. And for some reason, our patch management missed those. 
If only they would make it easier to update these things. Java especially, you know, you have to click and say yes, it can in install, and then it just puts up the little note and says install update, so you actually have to click it twice. I don't know. They don't ask my opinion. Maybe they should. But, you know, I ran into this very much with this laptop, because it's like everything on it is so out of date, because it had literally been off for a year. And what was I going to do? What is the first thing I did when I got this laptop? Well, I opened up the internet, I went to a site that sold parts to take apart a Mac, and I gave it my credit card number. Okay, to be fair, it was my mom's credit card number. So if anybody gets hacked, it's her, which I think is fair, given the circumstances. But that's what we do. I needed to take my Mac apart to get all the code that I had written. So I did that, even though I knew it was probably a very insecure thing to do. Client-side attacks abound. So we see those with mobile as well. We see mobile browsers fall victim to vulnerabilities. We see mobile applications fall victim to vulnerabilities. So we have an application on our phone that, say, opens maps, or opens PDFs, or opens documents, or opens music files. If I can send it a corrupt file that it still thinks is right, it has .pdf at the end, but triggers a vulnerability, same sort of scenario, I can get access to that device. Yes, I have to convince a user to download it for me and run it, but that seems to be pretty simple, all things considered. Like in my situation, if I really want what's on the other side, I'm going to click through whatever it takes to get there, to get my hard drive out of that Mac so I can get my code back that I hadn't backed up. Yeah, they can hit my credit card, I don't care. i got to get that code back. You should always back up regularly. Don't be like me. So that happens. Client-side attacks happen on your mobiles as well. You may be doing something through something like Mobile Iron or Good or one of those other enterprise mobility managements that says, this phone is not up to date. It must be forced to update or it gets thrown off the network. But you're not seeing anything like that for Mobile Safari or Adobe Acrobat or Google Maps. Nothing's checking to see whether those are up to date which we're totally able to do that on the desktop side, so we need to work on that as well. Mobile phishing. All right, all things considered, I used to think that social engineering and phishing and all that was something that people who weren't really that talented got up and talked about at security conferences so they could go to faraway places. I will admit that, I will also admit that I was wrong. Because then I started doing phishing attacks. I started you know, my own company. I took whatever work came to me. People said, can you do phishing attacks? And I said, oh, absolutely, I can do phishing attacks. I knew nothing about how to do them, but I figured I should watch some YouTube videos, and I'd figure it out. And sure enough, I did. And it turned out it was a good place to start doing something you don't know how to do, because you don't really have to be that sophisticated to make it work. By the end of the set of engagements, I had actually sent a phishing email that said, this is a phishing engagement to test how well your organization holds up to phishing. Please don't click on this. I still got like a 40% success rate. I mean, forget about it. On the mobile side, there was actually a research project that was done where they put up an application that said that they were had pictures of the new upcoming Twilight movie at the time. That was all it said. And it was actually like fake malware, but just within a couple of hours, they had hundreds and thousands, well, not hundreds of thousands, hundreds, two thousands of downloads. You know, they didn't like advertise it or anything, they just put it up there. I mean, let's admit it, some of them are people like me who just scrape all the web stores to get the latest malware, but it happens. You guys do any security awareness training with phishing emails in your organizations, anybody? That's good, you should be doing that, because we absolutely see people falling to that. No matter how good your security is, if people are just gonna give up their credentials or run something nasty as administrator, there's nothing we as security engineers can do to stop that by putting in security controls. So the only thing we can do is provide awareness so they don't click on that anymore. So that's good, you should be running those. Unfortunately, what I'm not seeing is people testing this on their mobile devices. Doesn't seem like it would be hard. In fact, I actually wrote a product to do it. This is probably the easiest thing I made in my entire smartphone pen test toolkit was the mobile phishing. But then when I started taking it to organizations and saying I'm productizing that, they were all like, can you do mobile phishing? And I was like, 
yeah, I can do that in like a day. So I don't know why people who do fishing don't just do this. So, well, I guess that's good for me because now I can sell them stuff. But text messages. Actually, sitting at my booth today, two different people showed me a phishing text message that they had gotten just today. So to say that it's not happening in the wild is a very naive thing to say. It's certainly happening. I'm sure you've probably gotten some, like, you want a gift card, click here, or, you know, you signed up for this with your, your phone number. What gets really weird about it is a lot of stuff does two-factor authentication via text message now, so that's a really good avenue to start phishing people for accounts, because it looks like what they actually expect to see, it coming in via text message. It isn't all just text message, though. I mean, that's the, the avenue we see people attacking, but what about near-field communication tags? I mean, they're all over the place. You, if you turn on your near-field communication, particularly in Europe, they're, like, obsessed with it. Like, hotel elevators have near-field communication tags. Or that may have been some hacker's tag, to be fair. I do tend to frequent places where hackers go. But that's something we could do as well, get people to scan our near-field communication tags and have them be malicious. What does it do when you scan a tag? It opens something like a web browser or a PDF viewer or a Maps application. Didn't we just talk about how great it would be if we could get people to open things in vulnerable applications? I love it when stuff makes sense. QR codes too, right? QR codes are a big mobile thing. I love QR codes because nowhere on that QR code does it say anything about what it actually goes to. A couple of years ago at DEF CON, during the scavenger hunt, somebody had the bright idea to put a QR code on the main like DEF CON symbol and have it look like it was part of the scavenger hunt, but it actually went to Goatsy. So just to sit there on the side and watch people scan it, thinking it was going to be part of the actual scavenger hunt game, and it instead opens the Goatsy website. Now that was some fun. I'll tell you that. So, I mean, you can do that. You can print out QR codes. There's an open source library, like in Python, that will make QR codes for you. You don't even have to really know how to code. You basically just be like, what website do you want? Call library, and it spits it out. A good first coding thing. So then you can just stick them wherever you want and, you know, put it on the Redbox thing or whatever, and people will think it goes to Redbox, but it really goes to you. People love to click on these sorts of things. Because it's cool and leet and stuff. Look at me, I don't have to type things in anymore. So mobile phishing is something we should be worried about. Because our mobile phones, you know, as we've discussed in the past two slides, have the same sorts of vulnerabilities as our other devices, so certainly we'd like to fish them. Mobile applications. So we all know now that my mother is obsessed with free games from the internet and the things that go with them. I think a lot of us could say the same thing about mobile applications. Anyone here want to admit an obsession with mobile applications? I should raise both hands. I'm totally obsessed with mobile applications. I mean, seriously, that slogan, there's an app for that, it's so true. There is an app for everything to make your life easier. Like, I can check in for my plane, I can get a taxi, I can check into my hotel so I don't have to wait in line. But unfortunately, you don't have to go to secure coding school to write an application. You don't have to know what you're doing. You don't even have to be a nice person. You can certainly write malicious software and make it look normal and put it up in a store. And whatever Apple wants to say about it, it's totally possible to get malicious stuff into the store. And even if it's not malicious, it's totally possible to get things like that send credentials to your bank in HTTP, so insecure. And if Apple can't tell that that's there, forget about it that they're catching some big O day. I'm not convinced. But, you know, I like to solve problems that don't exist. So I wrote some software that takes an application, rips it apart, puts malware in it, puts it back together, signs it with keys that you've stolen on your pen test, keys that you made up, or a vulnerability and then puts it in any app store that you want, makes a third-party app store, hooks up to your mobile iron app stores, things like that, or just puts it up in the real app store if you want to even. How is that ever going to like stop anybody from downloading it ever? If it's in your company app store, of course people are going to update. Actually, things like mobile iron can force you to update the security apps in your organization with my new piece of it. 
So what's really fun is, you know, we have our enterprise mobility management on the domain at work, as we do, so we can manage it in the correct way. I grab your domain credentials, log into your enterprise mobility management, add my malicious applications, and then push them down to your phone through the enterprise mobility management. That's a security tool, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So we like applications. Applications may be malicious already. Who knows? If you're in charge of the security in your organization and it is your job to see that no one is downloading malicious applications, good luck. People are like, well, we only allow whitelisted applications. That's the only thing we allow in our organization. No other apps are allowed. Well, now you have to hire a bunch of people whose whole job it is to answer those requests for applications to be accepted into the corporate app store. So there's your overhead there. So that doesn't really work. It's the same way like whitelisting applications on traditional computers never really took off. It's just too much overhead to make that work. So one way or another, there will be malicious applications. Users will probably download them. And even if the applications were not malicious to begin with, it's really not that hard to take an application and repackage it maliciously. You don't have to be super elite hacker to do that. It's something that there are packages that will do that for you. Like mine does it in a completely pen tester friendly way, but there are ones that'll do it for you in a malicious way. So people can attack you in this way pretty easily. It's like Martin Boss in his talk was talking about how, you know, your adversary probably is not China if you make like two by fours in a small town. Chances are China is not coming after you, but you know, the kids at home in their mom's basement who are bored and just want to show how elite they are, they could do this sort of stuff to you. If you're just the nearby organization who probably, you know, turned down their resume a couple years ago, you'd be a good target for them. This would be the kind of stuff that they would do, just as much as nation states, you know, people who are interested in seeing what they can do. So, now that we see that mobile devices are, are just as bad as any other kind of device, how long is this talk supposed to be, by the way? 45? Two hours, what? 45? Okay. All right, just checking. All right, so now that we're on the device, we've seen myriad ways that we can possibly compromise a device, pretty much just like a computer, just like a traditional device. We can do the same sorts of things to mobile devices. Now we're on there, now what do we want to do? Well, we can steal data off the device. So just think to yourself all the things that you have on your phone, as opposed to, say, your computer, because we know our computer knows a lot about us, and we know our spouse or children or best friend know a lot about us. Now think about your phone. What does your phone know about you? I think your phone probably knows more about you than really anything. It may know more about you than you do. I mean, look at how Google can decide what we want to buy and stuff. It knows some serious things about us. So all of the things that we've stored on our phone, email, text message, call logs, any documents. You know, I have a bad habit of downloading things to my phone that I need for work, reading through them while I'm on the go, and then forgetting to delete them. So they just sit in my downloads folder forever, waiting for a malicious entity to read them. I don't think my clients would like that. I should probably stop doing that. Location information as well, everywhere you've been. You know, if somebody wants to target you, somebody's got an axe to grind with you, if they can watch where your phone is going, they can see when would be a good time to break into the house. You know, if you're me, it's pretty much all the time, but people who are at home more. We can also control the device. One thing that's really good is if you're not going to click on a link in a text message that came from some random number, would you click on a link in a message that came from your best friend? Well, with security people, it's kind of hard because we're like, well, they could just be messing with me. But, you know, somebody that you don't expect to send you nasty grams, would you click on it? That circle of trust is very useful. If you can get, like, the IT department or the phone that is part of the enterprise mobility management where you are used to getting text messages from that make you do things, would you be more likely to answer it? You could also like log into your accounts and post things on Twitter, you know, like maybe some of those pictures that it stole from you that you didn't want anybody to see. You know the ones, the ones the celebrities got posted from those Apple backups. We all know that you've taken them. So you could post those and pretty much ruin your career. Record video of you. So silently in the background, record your voice or video. 
So think about where your phone goes with you. Now think about where it doesn't go with you. I think the list is much shorter. You can also do privilege escalation. If we have a malicious application on the phone, those applications are sandboxed. Well, those permissions that asked for it explicitly on the Android device, one by one on the iPhone, it asks for those permissions, and those are all the things it can do. But if it gets on the device and it exploits some known vulnerability, same as on traditional devices, you know, we're on a Windows box, we're a regular user, we use a vulnerability that's known on Windows that maybe hasn't been patched to get full system Sorry folks, it looks like the Avamia froze up again at this point, and we don't have anything but moving slides until the end. No voice or no live speaker. Sorry about that.